So Norm, this is a, a session that we used to run when we had our event coach uh, training in person uh, years ago, and um, we haven't done it uh, since we were forced by COVID to go virtually, but we thought, hey, this is maybe something that's important for uh, new event coaches to help get uh, situated and maybe to help you be more successful. Um, and so we're gonna, we'll go through this. As you have questions, uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand uh, virtually or to uh, type stuff into the chat and Stephen will help me uh, by flagging uh, those questions for us. So, um, and normally at this point, um, I'm accustomed to in the past being able to say, oh, how many of you are new event coaches or whatever? And typically, uh, a majority of the room is, right? So if you're a new event coach, uh, you shouldn't feel alone. Um, uh, this is new for a lot of the people who are involved. So uh, this is the just the, sort of the agenda of what we're going to talk about today you know, uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about the overview of the season. We're going to talk about how to think about uh, how you're participating, what your primary jobs are, how to get it done, where do you find resources. Again, we're just going to sort of go back and think about the overall, you know, like what's the, what's, what's the stage of the season. So we're going to go back to that high level view of things. And then uh, to the extent that there are additional questions or thoughts, there'll be time at the end for you to, to ask those. Uh, that shouldn't stop you from asking questions as we go along. So this is what the calendar looks like. If we look, you know, September through December is at the top up there, down through May at the end. Um, you see at the very bottom, there's our final destination of our tournament on May 11th. That's got the wrong date. It should say 2024. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, there we go. You can see where I got the source document for this. Um, and so in general, we're trying to get these teams formed in the fall and then uh, January up through the beginning of May is an opportunity for your, you with your event teams to be, your students to be practicing. Um, so things that are gonna go on as we go forward, here we are, event coach training today, January 13th. There's a block of time from late January through, there's a mostly through February, but even a few of them extend into March and April, uh, there are workshops that are being offered. Uh, most of them are in the are late January in the first half of February. And there's lots of links on our websites uh, for trying to get access to them. Uh, some of them are sponsored, are organized by us, us being Macomb Science Olympiad. Some of them are organized by uh, nature centers that are in our community. Um, and so if you can't find for these six events, if you can't find the links for those, you should raise your hand, ask your head coach, send me a note. Um, you should look look for those. There are then in so February is very much dedicated to workshops. March, our guns shift more toward practice tournaments, right? And then depending on what district you're in, determines what date your team competes. Uh, and this is a the uh, these practice or just what we call district tournaments as well. In some case, these are intended uh, as an opportunity for your student to sort of, especially if they haven't done this before, to sort of in a lower risk, lower pressure uh, environment, get a chance to see what's going on, right? So the, the rules are all the same, you know, in general policies and rules are very similar. Well, the policies are very similar to what happens in May. The rules are identical. I'd say maybe the, there's one exception to the rules. If you're an, on the arthropod event, um, we're going to say, please don't bring your uh, your collection uh, to the practice tournament because it, it won't be graded. Uh, there's not an opportunity for you to get feedback on that. It'll just strictly be the test portion of that event. But aside from that, um, this is essentially doing the same thing we're going to do uh, in May. Uh, some of the supervisors will make their tests a little bit easier. Uh, at the practice tournaments, just because it's earlier in the season and the and the students aren't quite as re aren't quite as ready for that level of challenge that they might see at in May, but again, uh, from a scope standpoint, it's still intended to be uh, a very good representation of what what competing in, on March or May 11th is 
like they would be. Uh, we have the a thing question the in the screen, chat. Uh, yeah. There are only workshops for those six groups, correct? That is true. We don't offer a workshop for all events. Um, I take that back. There's one missing from the list. Oh my goodness. Who's doing this job? Uh, there's an anatomy workshop. <laughs> we need to find out the person in charge of quality control there. It's two errors on the same page. Um, but yeah, so Macomb is sponsoring Rockhound workshops. We're sponsoring Code Busters, Code Warriors, and Anatomy. And so those are ones that, that our event supervisors are going to put those workshops on. Local nature centers are doing uh, offering, and there's multiple opportunities for some of these. Uh, wildlife, mostly wildlife and arthropods, uh, specifically the St. Clair Nature Center is offering um, a series of two workshops to cover the Starry Starry Night event. Um, and you, you know, the, the first workshop is for part, is for the first half of the, of the scope of the rules, and the uh, second workshop is, is focused on the second half of the scope of the rules. Okay, moving on. Feel free to keep asking. Oh, are there are there any other questions about anything that's on this page at this point? Okay, we'll keep going. Uh, some of the one of one of the resources that's available to your team or to your event team is that we offer quick start kits and supplies, and uh, similar to workshops, they're not for every event. Um, but they are for every event that we can think of something good to, to offer you. Um, and so the complete list is here. Um, and there are links on our website to get into the ordering system. Um, and um, quantities are not unlimited, but so I would say um, order soon. Uh, we make every attempt to not run out of things. And so the earlier that you order also helps us do a better job of inventory management. So, let's talk about what success is for your team because it's not necessarily going to be the same for every team. Not everybody comes to Science Olympiad with the same interest as to what they want to get out of it. Uh, but it might change how, how you decide to coach uh, and, and how you guys spend your time. So the range of you know possible answers that I can think of is hey we're in this for fun, and if it's you know we're we're gonna dial our level of effort into what we think that that equates to, or if you're a returning event team you, your goal might be that well we're gonna try to do better than last year. Uh, some teams come into it with saying hey we're gonna be number one, and I, I ca always caution event teams from that because that's a really hard thing to do because you're in. At the, at the Macomb tournament, you're going to be ranked against 30 other teams, chances are. Uh, and so being number one is a pretty, that's a pretty uh, big accomplishment. Um, sometimes it's appropriate, though. Um, doing your best, uh, that is not, that's maybe overlaps with uh, some of the other ones. Um, and it's one that I like. And that little diagram that I've drawn to the right is how my brain processes this, which is, you know, what is doing our best look like? What, how do we, how do we implement that? And I am usually, as an event coach, trying to encourage the students that, hey, we're we're in this to do something. We're we're gonna we're gonna apply ourselves. I, as as a tournament director, I meet lots of smiling kids every year. I I meet a lot of really smart kids every year, but I can tell you systematically the ones that do well at our tournament are the ones who work hard, um, the ones who actually put in the time. So anyway, so I like to get my students on the cycle of work hard, do well, and experience the satisfaction from that. And so I guess having fun isn't in the category of, hey, we're, we're goofing off doing something else. Anyways, that's how I think of it. But my answer isn't necessarily uh, your answer. So you want to think about this and it it'll, it'll may affect your choices as to how you how you spend your time uh, preparing for the tournament. 
So your job as an event coach, um, first of all, is to make it simple for the kids. Uh, and I, you know, I qualify that with as it can be. I'm not an anatomy expert in any regards. My background is mechanical engineering. Um, and so when I look at the anatomy rules, it makes it almost looks a little bit scary. And you know, that long list of all the all the very um, complicated sounding terms and whatever, and it's not an area that I know much about. Um, or arthropods, it has to, I have that similar feeling. And actually, years ago when I was a head coach, uh, I was put in a position where I needed to coach my arthropod kids for a while. I, we had trouble with, I don't recall why, but for some reason, I lost my event coach for that event and I needed to step in. Um, and so um, I can recall thinking through the process of, uh, you know, taking that big topic and breaking it down. Like, how are we going to get through this? There's a lot of material that needs to be covered. And so your job in making it simpler for the kids is to, you know, is to take that large topic, break it down into things that, you know, is consumable for them. There's a lot of resources on the internet and not all of them are kid friendly, right? And so you're trying to filter that out and introduce material to your students um, that they can be successful with, with uh, age, age appropriate types of materials. And sometimes it's taking that content and turning it into a format that makes it easier for the kids to, to utilize like flashcards. So I'm thinking, again, I'm thinking back to um, that arthropod event. I organized a series of flashcards uh, with the various uh, insects and such on them. And I can remember being on a, on a, the uh, two kids who happened to be on that event that I was coaching uh, were also on a school field trip someplace. And we all happened, it ended up, we were all on a bus together. And so I brought the arthropod flashcards and we had a, we, you know, the, the two, these two kids were very competitive between themselves. And so they were both trying to be the best at it. And that, that was a great learning environment for those kids. Um, anyway, so you're looking for ways, to, you know, looking for those a variety of opportunities or formats or whatever, what's going to help the kid uh, learn the skill they have to learn, learn maybe if it's a memorization event, learn the content. Um, and eventually, then there's uh, also there's a number of different things that, you know, you can be learning a subject, but you're also the kids need to learn how to manage their time well, because they're going to be under a time constraint when they're in the tournament. Uh, they're going to have to be able to work as a team. So you as an event coach are going to want to, by the time you're, you're coming to tournament, you're going to want to have given them specific assignments potentially. Um, so for instance, some of our events use a zip grade form. Um, in addition to training them actually how to use it and use it well, so that they're not trying to figure that out on the day of the tournament. Um, you want to know which, you know, typically there's two kids in the room. Uh, only one of them hopefully is going to be holding that zip grade form. And so you as an event coach want to have decided in advance which of the two students is going to have that job, right? And so there's, you could, the, the worst possibility is that uh, you see, and occasionally we see this in the event rooms where two kids are arguing about something. That's never a good sign, right? So you want to have given out those uh, assignments in advance, thinking about um, how to best utilize the resources of your event team. Um, so that's a big part of the task, make it simple for the kids. Um, you're also, as a leader of your individual event, you're demonstrating commitment, right? And, and the, the kids will reflect how you how you come to practices will will influence how they behave. Uh, and so you being organized and prepared helps uh, set that tone for your event practices. And um, and maybe that's not dramatically different from the idea of creating accountability as well. So setting a practice schedule, giving assignments as appropriate, or if, if you have asked somebody to do something, to actually follow up with it and expect that they will have done it. So I'm going to keep going if you guys have any questions. Uh, feel free to ask them. So from a execution standpoint, continuing on this idea of, you know, how are you, how are you behaving as an event coach? 
um, the schedule, uh, my advice to you is to pick your time of the week, right? It could be Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. at your house. It could be uh, Tuesday at lunchtime at the school with the kids. That's not, there's a lot of interferences there. I'm not sure that's a great time, but it could be after school at the school, uh, a particular day of the week, something like that. And so you, what you wanna do is pick a, pick a venue and a time that between, I'm assuming that you as an event coach, you're coaching your own child and you're coaching another child who also is on the team from your school. And so you've had a conversation with that other family and to try to agree on, oh, Tuesday at 6.30 is a time that systematically most weeks will work for both families, right? That's the idea. And so then you're, you're rather than managing, trying to find a time every week that works and maybe it's different from week to week and there's confusion about that, now you're down to managing the exception. So the, the presumption is that every Tuesday at 6.30, we're gonna meet unless it needs to change. That is a much more successful time management and schedule management approach um, than other things. So when you're thinking about how long those meetings are, uh, it might be driven by a number of things. One is just the age of the students that are involved. So we have students that are anywhere from third through sixth grade uh, in our tournament, and um, that's relevant. Uh, the younger uh, students might not have the ability to, to maintain. Um, 60 minutes is, I think, is pretty common. The 90 minutes might be less so. Um, I'm also sensitive because uh, I still coach kids at, at the high school level. Um, the Just the whole logistics around getting together to meet. And so I'm, as an event coach, I'm typically motivated to try to make my event meetings longer as, as provided we're being productive, just because of the fact that there's been an investment made in getting together to begin with, right? And so I, I do try to, I do lean toward the, some of the longer times. Um, if you're, I'll say, if you're doing a building event where like, so for instance, ping pong propulsion, um, that might be a motivation uh, to pick some of these longer time sessions because for that event, if you haven't finished building your device by the time you're coming to a tournament, like a practice tournament, it's pretty hard to get any benefit out of that practice tournament. Whereas if you're doing a study event like anatomy, um, you know, if you've covered 90% of the material, you can still have a good experience at a, at a practice tournament. Um, it's not an all or nothing arrangement. So you might be thinking about that as well. Like, are you on a schedule that gets you to the point where you're ready to compete? Um, other things from a scheduling standpoint to help be successful is just th you know, sort of think about the format that you're in. And so for instance, like the example I give here is if you're meeting after school, the kids might need a few minutes to burn off some energy before they're ready to sit down again and, um, and focus on something new. And so you ought to think about that. Or and, you know, should you be offering them a snack or whatever? Or if you're having a long meeting, those same ideas might work. Uh, to you know, structurally say, hey, we're going to meet for 45 minutes and then we're going to take a five minute break uh, and then we're going to get back to work. But if you're going to do something like that, be be deliberate about it. You don't want the kids to be thinking that, you know, taking five minutes off at any time along the way is how you're going to behave, right? So it, that, that structure matters. Uh, and that sort of flows into this next idea of the discipline. The kids follow your example starting meetings on time, ending on time, things like that. I had one year where one of the kids wanted to bring a friend, you know, it was we were meeting after school and they wanted their friend to hang out and wait for them uh, while, uh, and this was a student who wasn't on the Science Olympiad team, was not on the event that we were practicing. Uh, that was a really bad idea. <laughs> and so uh, we didn't, we, we shut that down pretty fast, uh, but so, you know, let, let's let's get to work and let's and let's let's focus. Um, creating motivation within your team. Some of the ways that you can do it. Uh, one is to uh, accomplish goals, and so being able to you know say, hey, we're we've uh, you know we've accomplished you know half of the material that we're trying to get through, or even just you know the, the accomplishing what you'd set out to do the, for the day. So 
if, if you've got a plan about what you're doing, that allows you to share with the students, hey, we're getting it done. We're making progress. It might seem like a really large or undefined scope of material for them at times, but you can help them feel successful along the way by sharing with them the progress that you're making. Uh, other ways to motivate is to try to make things fun, and that can have to do. It can, uh, if you can, if there's a field trip that you could associate with your event in some way, or maybe the snacks are part of uh, making it fun. And this is probably not my forte, even though I'm talking about this. You might have a better idea than I do about ways to make your meeting fun, uh, and so including that is is part of what you might be thinking about. Uh, one of the things that one of the, my favorite. Uh, things to do, and I, as a head coach, uh, I did this, um, but you might find the opportunity to do it as well, is I found myself in the school meeting with the kids on occasion or whatever, and maybe crossing paths with the principal or with uh, the, the student's teacher or whatever, and I love taking the opportunity to say, hey, uh, to, you know, to the principal or the teacher or some other adult and say, let me tell you, while the, while the students them, the, uh, from the team are standing right next to me, let me tell you about the great things these kids are doing, right? And to be able to brag on them in front of other people. Uh, I've, that was, that's one of my favorite ways to uh, motivate the, the interest of those students. All right, we're going to keep going. So another job that you have is to find and build resources. And so uh, the first item on this is read your rules. And it's repeated multiple times because reading your rules, not only for getting started is critical, but what you're gonna find is that a month in, if you've been working on this for a month, is that you'll forget some of the things that are in the rules or your perspective on what the rules mean. This is probably even more likely. Your perspective will have changed because you'll know more about your event. Um, and uh, and so my advice is once a month, sit down and read those rules again, because you might find something that you miss. And there's nothing more demoralizing than getting to a tournament and finding out that you missed a detail on the scope of the rules, especially. So I'm thinking now, and I, speaking from experience, uh, getting to a tournament and finding out that the, a parameter of a build event we, that we ignored and the team got got disqualified or got tiered because you know, they didn't, you know, what they were doing didn't match the rules. That's a really disheartening um, uh, place to be. So read your rules. Uh, be available, know what we're offering you in terms of um, resources. Every event has a web page dedicated to it. So if you haven't found that on our website, go, you know, go to Macomb Science Olympiad, macombso.org, go to the elementary, under elementary is events, and under under events is every individual event. We talked about workshops already. Uh, there's an FAQ system. If you if you you're you have questions about uh, the event, you know maybe a month from now it's like, oh, I wish I'd asked that a que question back on January 13th. You can type it in, and that question goes off to the event supervisor, and uh, the the answer is then published to our website. So um, even if you don't have a question, you might go look at the FAQs that have been posted because somebody else might have asked a question that you didn't think to ask. Uh, we've got quick start kits. I've already mentioned that. So we spend a lot of time thinking about ways that we can help event coaches be more successful. On that subject, yes. Um, yes. Uh, where can we find this presentation after the call? This will be... Um, listed on the uh, event page um, there's a there's actually a, been a video of this in past years because we didn't feel the need you know the the video the, the um, presentation was just embedded in the recording because we used to hold this session live um, and so this will be posted on that event page um, on our website it, I don't think it doesn't exist there now because we, in the past, um, didn't hold the, didn't have this session in this format. So I guess we'll have a video from this as well. So um, I guess I've got to think about that. That's a really good question. Um, 
probably both will be available on, on that event page. Uh, another thing you should do for uh, finding and building resources is ask other people for help. And my number one example of this is who at your school coached the event before you, right? Because then by virtue of the fact that they went through an entire season or maybe multiple seasons coaching that event, they learned some things. And your, your team, your event team and your team as a whole will get better if your team doesn't have to keep relearning the same thing over and over and over again, right? And so if your head coach hasn't told you who coached it last, you should ask them, right? And try to get contact information from them and give them a call and, and ask for their advice about what worked well, what didn't. And you, you may have a different perspective on some things than they do, but uh, it can't hurt. Um, so the internet is another great source for information. And um, you know, I write it here as it's a wonderful, terrible thing because the internet, internet feels infinite sometimes. And there's a lot of information out there that isn't helpful. Uh, but the challenge for you is to find things that help you deliver simple. Uh, and, the, you know, and especially for elementary age, it's, it's age appropriate. So uh, an idea is, can you make it finding information be a learning task? How can the kids be involved? Um, this isn't something that I've had a lot of success in doing, but I think it's a good idea. Um, so if you can, you know, sub out some of the work, have the kids do some uh, work on their own, maybe, you know, maybe with, with, maybe with some help, but have them have some responsibility for presenting some of the information. That's a different style of learning uh, and it can be very successful. So my last piece of advice in this category is to act like you own the event. And what I mean by that is that when you're all done, there ought to be something, there ought to be something physical, or when I say physical, it could be digital, uh, that you've created in the course of being an event coach for your event, right? To the extent that you've organized study materials, you might have uh, organized practice tests for your kids to take, um, uh, you know, have a binder that you're handing back to the to the um, to the head coach at the end of the season, um, and really, it's, you know, it's it's the answer to this question of what do you what would you really wish somebody else had given to you at the beginning of the season? Some of the some of the best run teams in our tournament have gotten good at this, right? So that they're not starting over every time. Now, for some events, the the scope tends to rotate. Like if you're a wildlife safari event coach. Um, the, the resources that you build might not get used for another four years, but still it's a valuable, it's a, it might be a valuable thing for your, for your team to own. Okay. So let's uh, talk a little bit more about finding resources, uh, some approaches and just some examples here. And so I took the time to look around on uh, several different events here. So just let's talk through these amazing arthropods. So uh, this, when I saw the, the, the little block here, it says there's more than 1 million species of insects. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much the example of the, in, the uh, internet being infinite. Um, and so you're, you're, you're trying to get this to, into consumable sections for the kids. So there's a lot of resources out there online, but also on our website, uh, our, sup our arthropod supervisor has done a fantastic job of providing resources to you that will then also help direct you to other resources online. So we have an explicit study guide for that. There are other resources. The, the presentation that that supervisor just gave today also has links in it. Um, and so you ought to be looking, hopefully you had a chance to attend uh, the, the sessions that you're an event coach for today. Um, but if you did not, you should go to our website and find those and see what the supervisors recommended because they're going to help put fences around things that are on the internet, right? Uh, and so the, in, in that particular case, there's a study guide and there and there also, uh, as I mentioned, workshops at the nature centers. So the charged up is another example. This is a lab type event where the kids need um, hand, sort of hands-on type experience. Uh, building circuits and understanding how they work and some of the concepts around them. Um, and so um, 
I did vet these. Um, the, the, I had an example of this page from giving this presentation four years ago, and both of the or th all, there were three links that I had on it then, and none of them were good anymore. <laughs> they were all either either they just didn't exist anymore, or one of the things that uh, I notice on the internet now for a lot of these things is that um, sources are trying to monetize uh, the the resources, the good resources that they put online, and so they find out that oh, there's a subscription involved. I believe you can do this without having to resort to that. And so uh, I, here's a couple examples, but I only spent 10 minutes on this uh, and found th those two particular examples uh, for charged up. And I'm confident that there are other ones that are out there as well. One of the other things you can look for is that there are uh, not the current supervisor, but our past charged up supervisor ran a workshop several years ago, and we videotaped it, edited it, and published it on our website. And so that's another resource that you can find. Um, our current supervisor just uh, in the past few weeks published a new study guide for his event, and that's already posted on our website. That's something brand new that we've not had before. So those are good examples of resources for Charged Up and, and how to think about it. Water Rockets is a different category. Um, this is a narrow from the standpoint of, you know, it's not near as broad as as, as bugs and, and electricity, um, but there's still a lot of resources that you can find that don't match our rules. And so that's one of the things you need to pay attention to. Um, and so I've given you a couple of links. One is something on the National Science Olympiad website. Another is uh, a web page that it's produced by Robert Yeowens, uh, who is this is what he does for fun in his off time, I think, for uh, water rockets. And he's got loads of information on that web page. Uh, some of it's not appropriate for our event because it's out of bounds. But he, And he has a tips page specifically for Science Olympiad within the scope of everything that he's got out there. Um, but again, you still have to pay attention. Just because it says Science Olympiad doesn't mean that it exactly matches our rules. So you want to be careful. Um, we, again, had a workshop on that. So anyway, so these are just some examples of the kinds of places where you can go find resources. Um, and to the extent that you find them and you organize them, you ought to be thinking about how how is this going to be easier for the, for the event coach that follows me, right? Okay. We're getting close to the end here. Um, in terms of how you think about your season, um, there are a few different stages to this. One is, hey, I'm trying to figure out what we're doing. I'm getting organized. And depending on the, the this is a task that as you go along the way, you might be having to stop and do this frequently. And like every week, you have to spend some time prepping for what your meeting is, what you're going to cover in your meeting. Um, and so that there's, a, there's a getting organized task and uh, or maybe you're going to stop and figure out how to write a practice tournament for your for your kids to take. Um, so that's one slice of of uh, how you should be thinking in your season. Another one is there's a period of time, the red bar here is where your kids are learning a topic or a skill, and you may be right along with them, uh, or building a device, right? And um, and so that's a period of time, and that is distinct in my mind from the task of preparing to compete, right? So as you get, as you come up against your practice tournament and as you get ready for the main tournament, there are additional skills and perspectives that are different from just learning the topic. And so uh, let me try to clarify this. In terms of the roles for the kids, in the learning mode, that red bar, um, and say if you're if you're covering a topic or you're giving the kids practice tests or you're even just asking questions, um, oftentimes you want to be letting the kids perform independently because you'd like to know um, which one of them is getting it. And if, if, if one of them's not, you'd like to know that as well, right? So you need to understand the, you know, the degree to which each of the individual students are performing. But then when it's time to prepare for team mode, that's more about having defined roles and cooperating in division of labor, right? So um, uh, years ago, I coached the Simple Machines event, 
and I had some practice tests that I had created for them. And early on, when I'm giving them quiz, I'll call them quizzes. To, uh, I'm giving them a quiz like, "Hey, did they did they understand the material that we covered?" I, each of them got their own quiz because I want to see how they're doing it, how they're each individually doing. But then, as we got closer to a tournament, I gave them a practice test where and and we had talked in advance of taking that practice test, like, "Okay, how are we going to do this?" You know, is one student stronger on a particular topic than the other? Uh, is one of them going to be holding the zip grade for them uh, and filling that out, whatever? Uh, and you're starting to put your kids under time time limits, things like that. And so, um, knowing how they're going to cooperate and behave as a team and make the and and be the best as a team is important. And that's something that you you want to do as you're leading up to those tournaments, right? What's the division of labor? What are they doing? If there's if there's disagreement on what the right answer is, how do you resolve that, right? If if you if you might have a situation where one student is much older than the other one, it could might just be as simple as the older student makes the gets the final call. Uh, if they if the, each of the kids have a strength area where they're stronger than the other one, you might it might be a more sophisticated or more detailed set of rules for how you expect them to behave. Uh, and in terms of, um, so I talked, I, you know, I sort of wandered into this material as you prepare here already in terms of, um, you know, things can be subject specific or focus, you know, focusing on understanding for from, from a learning mode, but team mode is more integrated. It's timed. It's focusing on execution uh, along with the, doing it in the content area. So hopefully that's, hopefully that's a clear idea. Um, I'm done with the topics that I want to talk about, and so I'm quite happy to take questions um, or any other comments that you might have. So, um, are there any? Okay. Uh, we have a uh, question from Sarah. When will these video recordings be uploaded to the website for review? Uh, we hope to get them done. I'll say within a week. The, the answer that's in the back of my head is uh, within 24 hours. But the reality will probably be somewhere between those two. Uh, if, we, if we can get it done in 24 hours, we will. Um, or 36. Uh, I'm really hoping that we have them up before the end of the week. What um, what other questions do people have? A question in the chat: um, Who pays for the quick kits? Uh, that's a policy that's set by your own team, I imagine, right? So that's a that's a question that I can't directly answer. Um, your head coach uh, is gonna is gonna be the one to ask uh, about that. So some school, you know, this is a policy, a school specific policy. Some teams um, get financial support through their PTOs or, you know, through the, you know, the, the cash budget of the school. Um, some of them uh, lean more toward the, the families on the team are doing it. Some of them are doing fundraising. Uh, so there's a, a wide range of possibilities. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks for taking the time to attend today. Hopefully this helped you a little bit. Um, and if you've got questions, uh, generally our email addresses work. So uh, there's a lot of places on our website where you can find somebody who you can ask a question on if you feel lost um, and your head coach ought to be a good resource. Um, but uh, we're, we spend all of our time volunteering for this. 
to help you be successful as an event coach. So uh, we spent a lot of time focused on that. So hope you guys, hope you have fun. Hope your kids have fun doing this together. So thank you very much.